Hi, my name is Marcus. I'm a born again believer, and I'm doing a presentation on once saved, always saved. So the question is asked in the Bible, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But there's only one way to be saved, and that's through Christ's imputed righteousness to all those who believe on him. Second Corinthians 5.21 says, for he hath made him to be sins for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I think that's really important to remember. You're made the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. Thusly, when you're in Jesus Christ, you are made the righteousness of God because in Jesus is no sin. And if he fulfilled the law, that means you're perfected in Jesus Christ. And we'll see verses to support that. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, right? That's important to know because what? Without faith, it is what? Impossible to please God. The just shall live by faith. So it's critical to understand that Jesus had to walk by faith when he became a man so that he could be pleasing to the Father. Otherwise, it would be impossible for Jesus Christ to please the Father. He had to walk by faith. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And again, Jesus fulfilled the law so that when you're in him, you, he fulfilled the law on our behalf, right? That we may become the righteousness of God. We'll touch back on Galatians 2.16 and why it's written that way. Another thing I want to note is that if you look at Galatians 2.16, uh, go to Bible Hub, type it in. You'll notice that the faith of Christ has been changed to the faith in Christ three times. That is obviously an error. Um, that that can't be the case. Uh, that is uh, for all those who question uh, Bibles and say, well, you know, Bibles, you know, they think one Bible is the same as another. No, they're not. Um, that has been changed and that has been changed for a reason. And um, just when you think about the fact that um, without faith it's impossible to please God, Galatians 2.16 has to impute the faith of Christ to you because without faith it would be impossible to please the Father. So Jesus had to walk by faith. So I just underscore that point. So what is the gospel? Well, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, 15, 1, Paul declared the gospel. He said, I declare the gospel which I preached unto you, which I which ye also received, and wherein you stand, which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Because when Apostle Paul preached the gospel to them, if they believed something other than what he preached to them, if they don't believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, if they don't believe that um, he's the only begotten son of God, if they don't believe that he rose from the grave, all the things that people can misinterpret in their mind, you can give someone the gospel. For instance, you can go to Jehovah's Witness, give them the gospel, and they can say, you know, I don't really believe Jesus rose in the flesh. And they'll say, I don't believe Jesus is God. Well, you may have preached the gospel to them, but they don't keep in memory what you preached to them. They've convoluted in their brain. So they believed in vain. Uh, you have to believe the gospel is presented by the scriptures. So it says, for I deliver unto you, first of all, which I also receive, how that Jesus Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And just to let you know that that was a physical resurrection, he says he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. And after that, he was seen of about 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, meaning they were alive at the time that Paul was telling them this. But some are falling asleep. Sleep is a term used only for believers. So just remember that. That's important later on. So after you believe the gospel, what does that mean, right? John 3.16, I misquoted it here, but John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So by the law, the whole world is under condemnation, right? And the law is there to make man guilty before God that we understand that um, it's, a, it's a schoolmaster to bring us into Christ uh, because only Christ fulfilled the law. So you realize you need to be in Christ uh, who fulfilled the law so that you can become the righteousness of Christ, right? So we are all sinners rightly condemned before God, and the only hope is to believe in Jesus Christ, believe the gospel. So the Bible says what? Repent and believe. So when it says repent and believe, that just means to believe on Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. It doesn't say repent from sins and believe. Uh, that makes no sense. That's actually nonsensical. You can't turn from your sin. You're a sinner, right? 
condemned before God. And so if you could turn from your sin, then there'd be no need for Jesus to come. So you need to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved from the condemnation of God because we're all sinners who sinned against God, right? And after you're saved, of course, God wants you to walk worthily, right? You don't have license to sin, but after you're saved, there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So once you're saved, you're saved. There's no way you can lose your salvation. You can be chastised as a son, but you can't lose your salvation. So the question is, do you believe the gospel? Because there's no other way to get to the father but through the son, right? So what happens after you believe the gospel, right? Ephesians 1 13 says, in whom after you trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. So there are some who think, well, you're not saved until, you know, you die. That's not true. You're saved the instant you believe the gospel. After you heard and believe the gospel, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You now belong to God, your purchased possession. He bought you with a price. You're purchased by his blood. You're purchased by the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ. And it says you are sealed. So you've received the seal of God, the seal of God. And that seal is unbreakable. Now, although people may teach it's breakable, but it says you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, right? You've been paid for and now you've been sealed and that the redemption of that purchased possession will happen when? The day of the day of the Lord, right? So uh, your spirit is reborn in Christ and you understand that in Jesus there is what? No sin. So you're a sealed possession purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4a say, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he, Jesus, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. You know, before you believed in Jesus Christ, we were what? Trapped in sin. There was no way to be reconciled to the Father but by the Son, right? But we were captive. But the scripture says Jesus led captivity captive. So just like you were trapped in sin, you are now what? Captive in Christ Jesus, right? And that was the gift that you received by believing the gospel, by trusting on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? But some people make sin stronger than they make God. They say, well, you know, when you're a sinner, you're a sinner and there's nothing you can do, right? And which is true. There's nothing you can do but to believe on Jesus Christ. But then and they make it that it's a work that you must maintain salvation after you believe on Jesus Christ by stop sinning or doing good works or quote unquote bearing fruit, which are really just something they redefined as works. Um, salvation is a gift. And so even if you turn around and say, oh, the proof of your salvation is the fact that you bear fruit, you've really just redefined uh, works as fruit. And that's that's a lie because you do not. It's a gift. And the gift is received the instant that you believe, according to Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. So just like before you were saved, you were captive in sin. After you're saved, you're a captive in Christ. So. You got to understand that all sin is against God. Jesus fulfilled the law on your behalf. You became the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ and you're reborn in Christ. So the question I have for you is what is reborn? Is it your flesh or your spirit? It's obviously your spirit that's reborn, right? It's the spirit that is reborn. Your flesh is the same flesh. It still wants to sin. It still can sin and still does sin. But as far as God's concerned, you are what crucified with Christ means you're dead to the flesh, dead to the law and dead to sin. And it's the all things new means that your spirit is reborn and you have a glorified body, right? So if you have a glorified body, reborn spirit in Christ, and you're considered dead to the flesh, that means what? All things are new from God's perspective. So you're a captive by grace in Jesus Christ. First John 3, 5, and you know that he was manifest to take away our sins in him and in him is no sin. Well, if you're in Jesus Christ, right? And you're reborn of incorruptible seed, which is what? The spirit. How then can people say that you're sinning in the spirit? Yes, you can sin in the flesh, but again, you're dead to the flesh. Jesus Christ, you're considered dead to the flesh. And so though you may sin in the flesh, 
that does not account towards your salvation because your flesh, which which is the old man, does not belong to God. God's not going, your flesh is not going to heaven. That's why you have a glorified body. So people get confused because they see that paradox and they say, well, wait a minute. How can in one hand it say we're sinless and in the other hand say we still sin? You have to understand the new man, which is reborn in Christ, the new spirit man, right? Which is sinless and, and sealed in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And in God, there is no sin. That's why it says you become the righteousness of God. And then there's the old man. The old man is the flesh, right? But you're crucified to the flesh. You're dead to the flesh. You're dead to the law and dead to sin, right? Remember, the law is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Right, but after we've come to Christ, we're no longer under a schoolmaster or the law. Hebrews ten fourteen, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Just going to show you that you're perfected in Jesus Christ. Now I've seen uh, you know in scripture some people replace perfected with complete, and it's true, we are complete in Christ. But don't confuse that. You are perfected in Christ. Not because you're perfect, but because you're reborn in the spirit of God and sealed in God. Thus, you're perfected in Christ, right? Because you're sanctified or set apart in Christ. This is all through Jesus Christ. This is all a gift. This is all just because you um, obeyed the gospel and you do that one time. You're born again once. You're not born again over and over and over again. Jude 1.1, 1, 1. Jude, the servant of Christ and brother of James, to them that are what sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. This is really important to note, right? Them that are sanctified. You know, there's a false doctrine going around that people says, oh, we're, 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 um, there's a sanctification process. There is no sanctification process. Once you believe in Jesus Christ and you're born again, you're sealed in Jesus Christ. You are sanctified or set apart in Jesus Christ, right? By God the Father. And there's no perseverance of the saints, right? You are preserved in Jesus, right? And we understand that that happens because your spirit is reborn in Jesus Christ where there is no sin, though your carnal body, which God considers to be dead, right? And thusly, because it's dead, you're no longer under the law, right? Because dead man can't offend the law. You're dead, right? And thus dead man can't sin. You can't, by the law came sin, right? Right? And all that happened through what? Just believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So justly, you're preserved in Jesus Christ, and it's no longer I that live, Paul, Apostle Paul said, but Christ that lives in me. So once you believe in Jesus Christ, that is the end of you, right? So anyone who tries to confuse you with, oh, you must endure to the end, well, guess what? The minute you believe in Jesus Christ, you were crucified with Christ. That's the end of you, as far as God's concerned, right? So those who say, well, um, you must endure in the faith, well, guess what? The minute you believe in Jesus Christ, you're, you're dead to the flesh, right? And that's why it says the faith of Christ, right? So it's as if you died, you were reborn in the spirit, right? And the spirit is eternal, right? And then you're known by the father and reborn in Jesus Christ. And remember, Jesus Christ lived, what, 33 years? So you're in Jesus Christ for his whole walk, right? And then Jesus Christ did what? He he. Uh, died, never denying the Father, keeping the faith until the end, right? He right, he was buried and he rose again. And what it says for us, it says we are what? Seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And you'll see later on that he makes us to sit. We were made to sit with him, right? Um, um, in heaven. So this is all through Jesus Christ. So we're perfected, we're sanctified, and we're preserved. So we're sealed, we're sealed possession, captive by grace, perfected, sanctified, preserved, and we're the righteousness of God by him. Romans 5, 9, much more now than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Okay, we are justified, right? Remind you, all of this is after you believe the God, right after you believe the gospel, all this happened. This isn't, oh, I believe the gospel and now I have to do these things in the future. This is all the instant you believe the gospel, according to Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, right? Through the spirit, right? So we're justified by his blood. So we're sealed possessions, captive by grace, perfected, sanctified, preserved, justified by his blood. We're the righteousness of God in him, all by believing the gospel. 1 John 5, 20. 
And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. Obviously, now it's talking about God the Father, right? So that we may know him that is true, right? We may know God the Father through Jesus Christ because what we are in him. So you got to remember it said, uh, no one knoweth the father, but the son and no one knoweth the son, but the father. Uh, right. And no one knows the father, but he whom the son chooses to show him. So once you know Jesus, you are sealed in Jesus Christ. Right. So by virtue of being sealed in Jesus Christ, who the father knew from the beginning before the foundations of the world, you become known by the father. See how it works? You're in Jesus Christ. And because the father knew the son and loved the son, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You become pleasing to the father because Jesus Christ, what walked the perfect walk, never denied the father, was faithful unto death, right? And was what raised in newness of life, newness of the spirit, right? And sealed, um, raised in newness of life, right? And sits at the right hand of the father. And because you're in him, you're imputed his righteousness and you sit at the right hand of the father all because it's through him. The other thing I want to note is, right, when did, the, when did the son know the father? This is a great area of contention, right? The son knew the father before the foundations of the world, right? Before everything was created, they said, let us, right? Create man in our image. So God created everything, right? The creator is God, created everything, right? And that was before the foundation of the world. And that was also before you were even, what, born. So when you're in Jesus Christ, who knew the father before creation that's how you become what foreknown right by the father because this is the area of contention where some people say well those he foreknew well they think well did god pre-select some people to be saved and some people not to be saved no once you believe the gospel and you're sealed in jesus christ then because jesus christ was known by the father before the foundation before you were born you become foreknown by the father before you were born that solves the mystery that a lot of people get from Romans 8, right? Because Romans 8 talks about before they were born, Esau and Jacob, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And that confuses a lot of people. But that shouldn't confuse you because you, if you understand that Jacob believed God. Jacob believed God. But was Jacob a good person? Did Jacob do good things? No, Jacob didn't. Jacob did what? He stole his brother's birthright, stole his father's blessing, and did all kinds of things that we that were sinful. But righteousness doesn't come by the law. Righteousness comes by what? Believing, believing in God, right? And in this case, since Jesus is made manifest for us, we have to believe the gospel. We have to believe in the only name given under heaven whereby men must be saved. That's Jesus Christ, right? Believe on his life, death, burial, physical resurrection from the grave to save us from our sins. And since Jesus, again, what well, is eternal and and is in the Godhead, right? It's, it's part of the Godhead. Is you know in Jesus dwell the full Godhead. That's how we become known to God the Father before the foundations of the earth, which was before we were even born, right? So there is a great mystery solved, right? Jesus Christ is the elect servant, according to Isaiah forty-two one through six. Please look it up, and you'll see that you become elect by believing on Jesus Christ, who is the elect. And Jesus was before the foundations of the world. Thus, you become before become known by the before the foundations of the world, before you were born. Right. First John fourteen seven. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him. That explains what I just explained to you. Notice the language here. If ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also. Once you believe in Jesus, you become known, past tense, and going future tense you got to understand that time is a creation this is something like when you think about scientists and pe people who don't believe in god like neil degrassi and all those types of people if you talk to them this concept the bible has this concept perfectly what day is it in eternity well it's past it's present and it's future in eternity right there's no time in eternity, right? God stretched forth the heavens, right? So God stretched forth the heavens and stretch that's time being stretched out, right? So, but in eternity, there's no stretching forth. It is the beginning, it is the present, it is the future in time. 
right? So that's why it says, if you know me, you've known me in the past, you know me in the present, and you know me, in the, and henceforth you know me, you know him. So you go to the bottom here, you look at henceforth, it says from this time on and from that time on, right? Subsequently, hence, hereafter, going forward. There's no break in this, right? You're saved, you're a sealed possession, you're captured by grace, you're perfected, sanctified, preserved, you're the righteousness of God, you're justified by his blood, you're known by God, uh, forevermore and evermore in the past in the present and in the future you're a son eternally so salvation is a permanent event after believing the gospel period there's no caveats right false religions want you to do a couple of things they want you to have the wrong jesus they want you to have the wrong gospel they want to redefine simple terms like faith sanctification right and they want you to not what they really want ultimately want you to do is believe in the wrong Jesus and don't and not to believe in the finished work of Christ and that you are saved, as the Bible says. So let's go to Ephesians 1 13. In whom you also you trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Right? We've covered that. Now Again, this is talking about you believing the gospel and then you get the Holy Spirit and then it says you're sealed right until the day of redemption, right, of the purchased possession. Now, okay, this happened the instant you believe the gospel. Let's look at Ephesians 2.18. For through him, we both have access by what? One spirit, right? So all believers have access by one spirit unto who? The Father. When is this happening again? When do you get this spirit? the instant you believe the gospel. Now you have access to the Father, right? Right? You believed in Jesus Christ, right? You're baptized in the Spirit, right? Baptized into Christ, baptized in the Spirit, right? Right? One Lord, one faith, one baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? As John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me, he will baptize you with what? the spirit and fire, right? Jesus was tried by fire, right? So Jesus baptizes us by the spirit. We're baptized in the spirit. That is the baptism that counts, right? Not the putting away of filth of the flesh, right? But the answer of a good conscience, right? And the answer of a good conscience is what I talked to you earlier about when Paul says, if you keep in memory what I preach to you, right? unless you believed in vain. That's believing the true gospel of the scriptures, believing on the Jesus Christ of the scriptures. Because there's many, quote unquote, Jesuses that have gone out into the world, false Jesus, antichrist, right? There's many gospels that are not truly a gospel that have gone out into the world. So the devil wants to deceive us. He wants to deceive you. Even as a Christian, he wants to deceive you and get you confused on the gospel. Because even if you are saved eternally, right? If he can get you to give a false gospel, He's stopped other people from being saved. So it's really important that we understand this, right? So we say through him who Jesus, we have access by the spirit, right? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're baptized by the spirit and what you're made known, what to the father, as we just saw before, right? If you had known me, you know my father also and henceforth, you know him, right? Now, therefore, we are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, the Godhead, right? The Godhead. Isn't that beautiful? Remember when Jesus was being baptized, right? Jesus didn't need to be baptized, but Jesus said, suffer it to be so that all things may be fulfilled because Jesus was fulfilling the law, right? And this is before Jesus began his ministry, right? And remember what happened? Lo, the heavens open, right? The dove, the spirit descending on Jesus like a dove, right? A voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, right? What happens with us? We believe the gospel. What happens? We are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Remember how Jesus was baptized? The Holy Spirit sat upon Jesus like a dove. We are baptized in the Holy Spirit right? And we are what? Sealed in Jesus Christ, right? And we become known by the Father, right? 
because we're sealed in his what? Beloved son in whom he is well pleased, right? And so thus Jesus fulfilled the law. Think about this. In the Old Testament, had we had Adam and Eve not sinned, because God said, I prefer obedience over sacrifice. But because we've all broken his law, we're all rightly condemned, right? And by the law, that, that requires what? Blood, right? But if God killed us, then what could we do? There's nothing we could do. We would die. We'd be separated. There's no way to reconcile us from God because the penalty of sin is what? Death, right? So though God says, I prefer obedience over sacrifice, who was obedient? Jesus Christ, right? Unto death, right? He's the only one who was obedient unto death by faith, never denying the Father. Then Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, go find out what this means. I will have what? Mercy and not sacrifice. Why did Jesus tell the Pharisees that, right? Well, the Phar Jesus told the Pharisees, he says, told the Pharisees that, you know, they had paid uh, tithing of mint and anise and cumin, right? But they neglect the weightier matters of the law, right? Judgment, mercy, and faith, right? Judgment, mercy and faith and obviously this is before jesus christ went to the cross and became the lamb of god right he was the final tithe but the reason jesus christ said that they neglect the weightier manners of the law judgment mercy and faith is because the law was there to do what it's a schoolmaster right it was there so that all men may come become guilty before god right to let us know that we're all sinners right and the law being a schoolmaster to bring us unto christ by the law, no flesh will be justified. So now we understand that we're all guilty before God. What do we need? Mercy, right? So how do we obtain mercy? Well, Jesus, right? The seed, right? The incorruptible seed, right? The firstborn of many brethren who became flesh, came and lived a perfect life, right? Died, was buried, rose again, and sits at the right hand of the Father. We have to believe on the, we have to believe the gospel as sinners so that we may, and we have to do that through faith, so, so that we may obtain that mercy, right? So we need mercy, and how do we get that? By faith. John 16, 9 says, right? Of sin, because you believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I return to the Father, right? It's proved that Jesus was righteous because he conquered sin in the grave and he was accepted by the Father. Of judgment, because what? The prince of this world is judged. Satan is judged. And and hell is hell in the lake of fire was made for whom? Satan and his angels. It wasn't made for us. That's why we can be reconciled to God. But who can't be reconciled to God? Satan and his angels, right? So when some people say, well, God doesn't will that all men be saved, which is a direct contradiction of the scripture. God does will that all men be saved. because That's why it says the lake of fire and hell made for Satan and Satan and his angels not made for, for man. Man can be reconciled to God if they believe the gospel, right? They just have to believe in Jesus Christ, be sealed in Jesus Christ, baptized in his Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, we have access to the Father, right? And we're sealed in eternity, right? In part of the household of God. We're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God, right? So Jesus was obedient, right? But the Jesus who was obedient became the sacrifice so that we who are disobedient can obtain mercy by faith in Jesus Christ. So let's look at Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, right? Go and find out what this means, Pharisees. I will have mercy and not sacrifice for his great love wherewith he loved us. Even when we were what? dead in our sins the law is a schoolmaster to lead us into christ he hath quickened us together with christ by grace ye are saved there's some people saying there's cheap grace and easy believism and it's so funny you know what these people are proving they don't believe in grace right grace is great the very definition of grace is unmerited favor something you don't deserve right by grace ye are saved right and he has raised us up together and made us. He hasn't requested us. It's not that we do anything. He has made us. It's not an option. You remember, you are a purchased possession. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. You are kept, you're a captive in Christ, in the Godhead. 
And that's inescapable. Remember, you're dead to the flesh, right? Dead to the law and dead to sin. You are sinless in Christ. So yes, he has made us sit together in heavenly places. Remember, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of the Father. You're in Jesus Christ. You're sitting at the right hand of the Father because you're in Christ, right? So he has made us up together, made us, raised us up together and made us sit together in the uh, heavenly places in Christ. Remember when the two disciples were saying, uh, arguing, they were saying, oh, I want to sit, God, one of us sit on your left and one of us sit on your right. And Jesus said, you know not what you asked. Think about it. Well, of course they didn't know what they were asking because what? Jesus Christ, what? Was sitting at the right hand of the Father and what? All those who are in Jesus Christ, who are in him, they are sitting. We are raised up together and we're sitting with Jesus because we're sealed in him at the right hand of the Father, right? So that's why when they were asking that to sit, one sit on the left, one sit on the right, they didn't know what they were talking about. They didn't know what they were asking, right? They didn't even understand that Jesus was doing that for all men, right? Right? So um, all those who believe in him, they have the rights to become the sons of God, right? That in the ages to come, he may show his what? Exceeding riches, riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus right isn't that beautiful god wanted to show his exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us right remember while we were yet sinners dead in our sins right christ died for us right god has commended his love toward us the fact that jesus christ died on the cross and all who believe on jesus christ can be saved does that take away his exceeding grace because people choose not to believe on him? Does that in any way diminish his grace? No. Think about it. If only one person believed on Jesus Christ, that it shows his exceeding grace. If everybody believes on Jesus Christ, that's beautiful. It shows his exceeding grace. But you know what? You got to remember, Christ did not have to do this, right? He didn't have to die for anyone. So that's him showing his exceeding grace and kindness towards us and the fact that he died for us. Now, the fact that some people are vain in their hearts and their hearts become darkened, you know, that and, and they're hardened in unbelief, that has nothing to do with, with that's all on us. That's nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Right? He's shown his exceeding richness, rich, riches of his grace towards us. Right? Right? He's a savior of all men, especially of them that what believe they could have been saved, but they didn't believe. So they were not saved for by grace. Are you saved? What? Through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift. I just wish people would understand what the word gift grace to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. I just wish people would just know what that mean that meant and take God at his word. And understand that salvation is a permanent event that happens the instant you believe the gospel. Not of works, lest any man should boast. By progressive sanctification, how could you say you're not boasting? Right? You got to understand anything where you could say, well, I did this and another person did that. No matter what kind of lip service someone pays and say, well, no, I only did it through the, I only did it all through Christ. No. It, you're boasting. You got to understand we're all one in Christ. So there's no progressive sanctification. Again, you are sanctified in Christ Jesus. For we are his workmanship created in Christ unto good work, which God hath before ordained that we should walk into them. A lot of false religions don't understand this. It says unto good work. So we're created in Christ. That means you're born again. You're a new creature. And it's after you are saved, of course, Christ wants you to, you know, not abuse his grace. That's obvious. That's obvious. He doesn't want you. To, he's not giving you a license to go and abuse his grace. Right. But people seem to neglect when, when Apostle Paul said, shall we sin so that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. But it, where the scriptures before that says where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Grace, grace abounds. Right. It says grace and peace be multiplied, right? This idea that, 
that the sacrifice of Jesus isn't sufficient to cover all sins, past, present, and future, is a blasphemous idea. People, I mean, no matter how nicely people package it and say they're trying to protect God's holiness, that is a that you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And that's when Apostle Paul says, unless you believed in vain, because if you don't believe that Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins, past, present, and future, you have rejected the sacrifice. You have not believed the gospel. So all the people who pay lip service and say, well, and if you keep sinning, you're going to lose your salvation. They're paying lip service, right? These are the people who, who, who claim that, they, that you know, they have a form of godliness, right? But they deny the power thereof, right? They, they, they deny Jesus Christ by their works because they haven't believed in the finished work of Christ that has saved, that saves everyone who truly believes the gospel. And because they didn't truly believe, they believed in vain. And now they're doing what? They're thinking, oh, I got to bear fruit. I got to do good works. I got to stop sinning, blah, blah, blah. No, you're saved for good works, not by good works. And if you don't have good works, it doesn't mean you're not saved, right? Because you got to understand that the work of Christ, who is long suffering, love covers a multitude of sins. So if you're in Jesus Christ, your sins are covered. Love covers a multitude of sins, right? Right? Which God has before ordained that we should. It's really important that people understand the word should. Yes, we should walk in them, right? We should. It doesn't say that we must. If it said must, then I'd understand, but it says should. So, you know, we have to line up online, precept on precept. We have to study, look at the words, look at the details. And I'm telling you, there's changes in the various Bibles, and it's really important that you go and look at these scriptures. Look at the KJV. Look at um, the other Bibles, and you will see there's been changes. And all these changes are to teach a false doctrine of work salvation, uh, to get you to deny, to get you off the fact that you are saved the instant you believe the gospel. And that is locked. There's nothing you can do to lose that, even if you tried. Right? First Corinthians 118. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. I do encourage you to go to Bible Hub, look this verse up, uh, type in First Corinthians 118, and look at how it's tight, how it's um, look how it's how it's um, look at it in all the different Bible versions. They're changing it to being saved, right? Because they don't understand. The reason uh, there's a verse that says um, our salvation is closer than when we first believe, well, that's easily explainable. The only reason it says it's closer than when we first believed is because though you're already seated in heavenly places, you're sealed in Jesus Christ, right? You're still alive in your flesh because when you believe the gospel, though you're considered dead to the flesh as far as God's concerned, he literally didn't strike your flesh dead or make your flesh disappear, right? Because then there would be no need for other people to have faith. They would see that every time a person believed the gospel, all the Christians would disappear. There's no need to really have faith because people would just see, they would just have the proof, quote unquote, from looking at people disappearing after believing the gospel. So you're still here, though you're considered dead to the flesh, as far as God's concerned, dead to the law and dead to sin, right? So because you're still in time, space, and matter in the creation, for you, from the perspective of a human being walking in time, it is closer because you're still in time. But from God's perspective, who is who who uh, transcends his time, right? It's already done. So that's just, you have to watch it because false teachers and people who don't understand who want to believe in works, you know, and they'll never, no one ever says they, you know, you got to, people don't admit that it's by works, right? Most people don't admit it's by works. They'll say it's by grace. They'll pay lip service. But really, when you listen to them, they just don't believe and they don't believe it's really done. They believe you can lose your salvation. You must bear fruits, all kinds of things that really prove they don't believe it's finished. Right? John 14, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto the Father. This is an important verse, right? Remember I said when you're reborn in the spirit, you believe in Jesus Christ, you're reborn in Christ, right? Jesus Christ lived, what, 33 years, right? He, we have the imputed righteousness of Christ through Jesus Christ, right? 
So what do you think that means? We're born in Christ, right? Our life is hidden in Christ. Well, Christ, when he was born, he was born of the spirit. When you're reborn, what are you? Born of the spirit, right? Christ walked 33 years perfectly without sin, right? And you're sealed in Christ. So you're imputed the righteousness of what Christ did. Christ, again, died, never denying the Father. And what? Is seated in heaven, died, died, rose again, and is seated in heavenly places, right? And he has made us to do what? Sit in heavenly places. Your whole life is hidden in Jesus Christ. That's what it means when it says you have his imputed righteousness. You have his imputed righteousness, which means you have to have his also, his imputed faith. And Jesus was perfect. He is and was perfect, right? And so that's why it says that we are perfected in Christ, right? Perfected in Christ, right? But then it says, and greater works in these shall he do because I go unto the Father. Well, okay, Jesus Christ as a man lived 33 years, but the Holy Spirit, which is eternal, right? Jesus Christ being eternal too, but I'm talking about his, his ministry as a man was 33 years. The Holy Spirit has been what? Working since the beginning of Adam and will be working until the end. But we're all sealed by what? We have access to the Father by what? One Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. So when we do works of the Spirit, who's doing that work? Is it us or the Spirit? It's the spirit, right? Remember, the flesh profiteth nothing. You're dead to the flesh. All the flesh does is war against the spirit. So the flesh profited nothing. Anytime you do um, a work of faith after being saved, that's because that's the spirit. Because you didn't quench the spirit in that case. You didn't resist the spirit in that case. But the spirit is always it is in you, right? And so, but say one believer does something of faith, another believer does something of faith. We're all part of the same body. So though we as individuals do different, uh, the, the spirit works through us, it's still one spirit. And that, that's the work of the spirit is imputed to all believers, right? The work of the spirit is imputed to all believers. So what Abraham did, what um, Moses did, what Paul did, that was all through the spirit, right? And that's imputed to you. Right. And the, and what you do is imputed to another believer. That's why the thief on the cross is going. The thief of the cross um, is actually going to have the same amount of works imputed to him as everyone else. Right. Because all of those who believe in Jesus Christ. Right. Are sealed in the spirit. And so we, it's only one spirit. And this is a big confusion amongst many believers because people think they're earning individual crowns and you're not. You know, we win souls, but we when we win souls, one planet, one water, but who God gives the increase, right? But each man's work will be judged according to what type of work it is, because no foundation can any man lay that is what other than what is Jesus Christ, right? And then it goes on to talk about whether gold or silver or precious stones or wood, hay or stubble. Well, people confuse that verse. It says no foundation can anyone lay that other than that of Jesus Christ. Then it goes on and talk about gold, silver, precious stones. And people assume, oh, these are things that can't be melted by fire. No, all these things can be melted by fire. Those are things, those are earthly things that people are building on the foundation of Jesus Christ, right? There's no foundation then other than what? Jesus Christ built on the what? Rock. Gold, wood, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble are, are earthly things. If you go to Revelations, it talks about the great harlot. She has gold. She has, you know, silver. She drinks from the cups, drinks some silver. Uh, she has, pre she's adorned in precious stones. You look at Catholic church, it's gold, silver, precious stones everywhere, right? You look at uh, the old um, altars and when they burned the fires, it was wood, hay, stuff. So all this stuff, you know, the, the, the old um, temples were built with, um, you know, these different adorned with gold and silver and precious stones and and you know built with with certain types of wood right so god is saying he's no longer right it's not with the temples built of hands right it's all from above it's all from above and if you keep reading that verse you'll understand that it says and people say well this is only for um the bema seat which you know it's another false uh, teaching it says knowing therefore the terror of the lord we persuade men 
Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to do what? Believe the gospel. Because if they don't believe the gospel, then they will do what? Stand at the great white throne judgment and face that judgment, right? Instead of having the imputed, an imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, right? Uh, so that that's basically what that means, right? So we have to understand that. Romans 8, 37. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Remember? For it is no longer I that live, but Jesus Christ who lives in me. Remember, the instant you believe the gospel, you are dead. You have the imputed works and righteousness of Christ, right? The righteousness of God through him, right? All the work that Jesus Christ did, he imputes that to you. Look at it like this. It's like you never, ever even existed and you were born and hidden in Christ and you're in Christ and his, 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 for all believers, just think of it like this. It's like you never existed and Jesus Christ was, who came from the Father, who was foreknown before the foundation of the world, right? Born of the Spirit, came, walked the perfect walk in faith, never denied the Father, died, was buried, conquered grave, sin and hell, right? Rose from the grave and sat in, sat, sits at the right hand of the Father, accepted by the Father, right? And, it's, and then, of course, he's still, you know, eternally, he's there. He's seated there in heavenly places and it's already done, right? He's already spoiled, spoiled principalities, right? He's, he's conquered Satan. Satan's, Satan's been destroyed. His work has all been destroyed. And because of that, there's nothing you can do to lose salvation. I mean, because one is, is by grace and it's a gift. It's not of us. So there's nothing you can do to earn it, nothing you can do to lose it, right? For I am persuaded that neither death, right? You're already dead to the flesh. Nor life, okay? So death, nor life, okay? Nor angels. So that's Satan, right? Nor principalities, the powers of Satan, nor powers, nor things present, <laughs> nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature, right? And you say, well, what about me? What about me as a creature? Remember, you're dead to the flesh. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. Shall be able to separate us from the love of God. You're sealed in Jesus Christ until the day of redemption. You no longer I that live, but Christ, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? So that scripture makes sense, but false religions will teach you, oh, you gotta bear fruit, you gotta do this, you're progressively sanctified, all lies. We are sanctified. We are perfected. We are sealed. We are the righteousness of God. We are born again. All We are seated in heavenly places. Right? And it's all by believing in who? Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Psalm 89, he shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. And I will make him my firstborn higher than the kings of the earth right jesus is king of kings he's the firstborn of many brethren right he is the rock of my salvation right remember no foundation can anyone lay that is other than as christ jesus right that's the rock wood gold silver wood hay stubble precious stones they're all going to melt if you go to revelations it says all the earth and everything will melt in a what fervent heat if you go to google and you look it up Diamonds evaporate at a certain heat. How did the Bible know that diamonds evaporate? Were they melting diamonds back in those times? Obviously not. But God being all knowing knows that a fervent heat is going to melt those diamonds. Diamonds are formed by heat. So whatever makes you can break you, right? So they can melt in heat, evaporate by heat. All right? All right. So he's king of kings, lords of lords. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore and my covenant shall stand fast with him, right? We have a new, Jesus is the high priest. We're under the new covenant, right? We believe the gospel, right? And what does God promise? He promises, right? They sh we shall be saved. Listen to this. His seed, right? Incorruptible seed of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. Also, also will I make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. If his children, that would be us, you're born again, right? If his children forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, right? If his children shall forsake my law and walk not in my judgments, these are people who are born again. If they break my statutes and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, right? And their iniquity with stripes. 
all whom I receive, I chasten, right? As sons, right? Those whom the Lord loveth, he chastens, right? Nevertheless, my love and kindness, my loving kindness, right? So that he can show his exceeding mercy, right? Kindness for us in the, in the ages to come. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Now, do you see why the faith of Christ is so important? The fact that we're sealed in him and that Jesus Christ walked the perfect walk and we're hidden in his life, hidden in Christ, right? And that because we're sealed in Jesus Christ, there's no sin to counter to us because we're of what? Incorruptible seed. You have to separate the new man, the inner man from the old man, the carnal man that does sin. And that old man, the carnal man, that's why that flesh will do what? It's corruptible and, can, and, and then dies. But as far as God is concerned, we're already dead to the flesh, dead to the law, dead to sin, right? It's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. So who is this Lord, Lord crown, right? We saw that it said nothing can separate us from the love of God, right? We saw that, you know, all these beautiful promises that were sealed, were possession until they were redeemed, captured by grace, the righteousness of God, sinless, perfected, sanctified, preserved, justified by his blood, seated in heavenly places, known by the God as a son eternally, henceforth, right? Well, why does Jesus say, depart, I never knew you, right? Because if you're known by God from uh, hint, uh, known by God in the past and henceforth, once you're in Christ and sealed by the Holy Spirit in the Godhead, Obviously, he can't say, I never knew you. That would make God a liar. So those people who he says, depart, I never knew you, are people who disobeyed the Father's will. Not everyone that said unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, right? These are people who said, hey, didn't I bear fruit? You saved for good works, not by good works. So the fact that you sat there doubting and you tried to, you know, wordsmith it to say, well, if you are saved, you will bear good fruit. These are these people, right? God saved you. It's a gift. You don't retroactively do the works on the back end and say, well, now if you are saved, see how Satan is so slick. He's, I beg you, Satan is so slick. He's just, oh, if you are saved, you will do good works, right? And he'll just use words. Well, you know, God is holy. He says, you know, he'll mix the truth with a lie. Right? And he'll, he'll redefine works as fruit. Right? Oh, if you are saved, you will do this. No, God justifies the ungodly. And we just saw that salvation is a, an event that happens after you believe the gospel. And that is it. It is done. It is finished. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. And if you don't believe that, but you and you believe in your mind, well, I heard the gospel, but I believe I gotta bear fruit. And you know, you start inventing words like, well, saving faith. If I have saving faith, it'll prove it because I'll bear it out by fruits. You're working. No matter what you define it as and say it's fruit, that's not fruit. Because fruit is only generated from people who are saved who know that they're in their flesh, they still sin. And know that the only reason they are saved, are saved, not will be saved, is because they know they believed on the finished work and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, right? All right? So these people who are saying, Lord, Lord, they're saying, hey, have I not done this? Have I not done that? Have I not done that? I bore fruit, Lord. And now professing them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity, right? Because even though they're they could have re redefined as fruit as Satan has done, he's saying you're not saved by what you do at all. Period. Anything. So th the instant that you believe the gospel, you're saved. There's nothing you have to do with it at all. Period. You not, you need to know and believe that you're saved by believing the gospel, and it is finished at that point in time. So the question is, when it says here, it says, he that doth the will of my father, which is in heaven, what is the will of the father? And this is the father's will, which has sent me, that all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but shall raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, 
that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Right? The will of the Father is that you just believe on him. Remember John 16, 9. Of sin, because you believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I return to the Father. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. If you just remember that, of sin, what is the sin? Not believing on Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, right? By the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now the sin is not believing on Jesus Christ. It's not two sins. It's not uh, because I don't believe in Jesus Christ and I don't keep the law. It's no, of sin because they believe not on me. Jesus Christ is the one who loved the Father, always did what the Father asked him to do out of faith and obeyed perfectly. You need to believe on him and have his imputed righteousness. You need to become the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way we can be saved, right? So Satan's tricky. Uh, Romans 3.20, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the works of the law, for by the law is the knowledge of sin, right? The law is our schoolmaster to bring us into Christ. After we are in Christ, there is we're no longer under a schoolmaster. We're no longer under the law, right? John 6, 28. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Remember, the work that I do, ye do also, and greater works than these, because I return to the Father. Galatians 2, 16. I'm going to go back to this verse, right? Because this verse is a little confusing. And it's been changed in a lot of Bibles. I want you to go to Bible Hub, type in Galatians 2, 16. I'm going to explain it real quick. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Notice faith of Jesus Christ is first. Then it says, even we have believed in Jesus Christ. That's in the middle. And it says that we may be justified by the faith of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. So it's bookend. The faith in Christ Jesus Christ is booked in, bookend by the faith of Jesus Christ, which is, that's something, right? And not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That is really, when you think about it, that's, that can be peculiar, right? Because there's, there are people, there are Calvinists who teach, right, that, well, God grants his faith to you. Well, the interesting thing about this is if you go and look up Galatians 2.16 on Bible Hub, you'll notice that in the Bibles that the Calvinists use, because they don't like the King James Bible, You'll notice that Galatians 2.16 that has taken out faith of Jesus Christ. Why would they take out the faith of Jesus Christ if they want to believe that you're granted faith? That makes absolutely no sense that they would take that out, you would think, right? Because you would think that this would somehow strengthen their position. But it's a two-edged sword because while it, it may seem on the surface to strengthen their position, it weakens it because how can you say you're progressively sanctified if... I'm telling you that you have the imputed faith of Christ, right? Because it would show that even when you become, if after you believe the gospel, even if you become faithless, right? You are sealed, you are held by the faith of Christ, who was faithful unto death, right? Right? It's pretty hard to teach progressive sanctification. It's pretty hard to teach that you must keep believing, quote unquote, or that there's proof that you believe is bearing fruit if you tell people and they understand that actually when you believe in Jesus Christ, you have the faith of Jesus Christ, right? But why is the faith of Christ before and after you believing in Jesus Christ? Think about it. We're here in time, space, and matter, right? It's appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. We need to believe the gospel when? Before we die. We being creatures who are in creation in time, when we believe in Jesus Christ, we are what? We are reborn in the spirit. When you're reborn in the spirit, you're known by the Father, right? And the spirit is eternal outside of time, which is before time. So you become known before the Father, which is outside of time, which is before the earth was created. And before the earth was created is also before you were born. It's before any human being was born on earth, right? So you are known by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, one God, before the earth and before creation, right? And the Godhead, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Father were obviously before creation. So though you believed in Jesus Christ in time, you are sealed outside of time and before time in the Godhead, right? And 
Because of that, the faith of Christ is imputed to you as if you were in Jesus Christ, who is before time, which is before you were born, right? And remember, your life is what? Hidden in Christ. All believers' lives are hidden in Christ, right? Remember, Jesus Christ said to um, the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. And they did what? Picked up stones to stone him because what? That statement, I am, is saying that, you know, basically he was saying he was God, right? And to say you're a God and everyone knows God was there before the creation. And Jesus is saying, I am, is saying he was God and was there before the creation. Well, we're not God, but we're sons of God, right? We're adopted and we're in the I am, which is before creation. So though you believed in time, Jesus Christ was before you, imputes his faith. And so you have the faith of Christ, right? Though you believed in time. And then because you have the faith of Christ, he endures to the end. It's, it's before and after you because you are what? Hidden in Christ who was before you and who was after you. But now because you're in him, you're known before and after you're known in eternity, right? So that verse actually makes perfect sense. But that verse gives way too much security, right? Because that verse shows just like Ephesians 1, 12 through 14, that when you believe in Jesus Christ and you have access to the spirit, you're sealed in Jesus Christ, seated in heavenly places. There's, it actually is finished, right? There's no more works for you to do, right? And of course, Jesus Christ said, yeah, we should walk worthily, which we are. We should walk worthily. Should we abuse God's grace? Of course not. But it also, this verse shows that you can't lose your salvation. Yeah, you can be chastised unto sleep, meaning the destruction of your carnal flesh. But as far as God's concerned, you're already dead to the flesh, dead to the law, dead to sin, right? So we go down to 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me makes perfect sense so now when you think about Esau right before they were born Romans 8 and had done anything good or bad well let me ask you the question who's good there's none good but one right and was Jacob good no, Jacob stole his brother's birthright, stole his father's blessing, did all kinds of stuff. He was, you know, I heard people describe him, he was a rascal, right? So Jacob wasn't good. I mean, from a human standpoint, actually, Jacob seemed like he was raising more havoc and, and being more sinful than Esau. But if you broke one part of the law, you've offended every single part of the law, right? But what did Jacob do? He believed God. Right. This is before Jesus was manifest. So he believed God. But when he believed God, he was what? Sealed by the spirit. And he was in the Godhead. Right. And because he's believed God, he's in God. Right. Who was before the foundation of the world and before he was born. He, because he believed God, he's imputed the righteousness of God. Right. The righteousness of God. Right. He's imputed the righteousness of God. And because he is imputed the righteousness of God, thusly he is good, right? Before they had done anything good or bad. The only way you can be good is by being in the one who is good, which is Jesus Christ, right? And though Jesus Christ came after, right? Remember, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, right? But you have to believe the covenant, right? You have to be born of incorruptible seed. And Jacob was born of incorruptible seed, thusly sealed in Christ, and thusly he was good. And that was before he had done anything good or bad. That verse is not saying that God pre-selected one of them. It's just simply saying Jacob believed God, right? And he was imputed righteousness and sealed in eternity, which was before the foundation of the world, which is before he was born, before they had done anything good or bad, because it's not of him that willeth or him that runneth, because by the flesh, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. It's not by the will of man. It's not because we can do good works. It's because Jacob actually believed and because he believed he was 
perfected. He was considered good, right? And so that's why it goes on in that verse and says, who can lay charge to God's elect, right? Jesus being the elect servant, whom I put my spirit upon, who will bring judgment to the Gentiles, Isaiah 42, 1, right? Through six. And you become elect when you believe in Jesus Christ. You become elect by faith. You're, you're sealed in the elect one, right? And you receive what? My elect servant whom I put my spirit upon. You believe in Jesus Christ. What happens? You're baptized in the Holy Spirit, right? By which you have access to the Father and become known before the foundations of the world, which is before you were born, right? Sealed in Jesus Christ. Makes makes perfect sense, right? So who may lay, who can lay charge to God's elect, right? Because the unsaved will then say, how in the world did Jacob get to heaven? The guy was... Look at all the sins he did. They're going to lay charge, right? They're going to be like, how did he get to heaven? He, uh, you know, just like the people wanted to throw cast stones at the lady who was caught in adultery. Well, look at what look look at what he did. He stole his brother's birthright. He stole his father's blessing. He did this. He did that, right? They'll look at Solomon. They'll say, how can Solomon? Solomon married all these women, had all these concubines, built altars to foreign gods. They'll look at Samson. Look at Samson. He used his strength to do all this stuff. He slept around with harlots. He was jealous. He used his power and strength and abused uh, the powers that God gave him. He betrayed God. He, he, all this stuff. They'll look at the sons of sons of men who married the dark sons of God who married the daughters of men in Genesis and say, look at them. They married all these unbelieving wives and they had all these babies, which then they, the babies ended up, um, you know, growing up and not really believing in the one true God because they had a house that was divided. I mean, they'll look at David who slept with Bathsheba and say, well, look at what David did. He he slept with Bathsheba. He had her husband got her pregnant had her husband uh, murdered he abused the army put other people's lives in jeopardy but yet he is a god after he's a man after god's own heart well that's because he believes god and he was sealed right he's perfected in christ he's perfected in god right because he believed god his sins are forgiven remember the law is a schoolmaster to bring us into christ right but after we are in, in Christ, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, right? He came to justify the ungodly. We became the righteousness of God, what? Through him. So who can lay charge to God's elect, right? That offer is for all men, no matter who you were and what sin you did. It's, uh, it's not that you broke the law is the reason you're going to hell. John 16, 9 says, it's of sin because you believe not on me. Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, right? Jesus Christ fulfilled the law, right? If you look in the Bible, it says, love worketh by faith. Therefore, Jesus loved the Father, had perfect faith, right? Remember, it says, love fulfills the law. Well, Jesus fulfilled the law, right? Remember, it says love covers a multitude of sins. Well, you believe in Jesus, your sins are covered. Remember, Jesus said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. You believe on his sacrifice, you obtain mercy. Jesus, the elect servant, whom I put my spirit upon, he will bring judgment to the Gentiles. Right? So it's of sin because you believe not on him because you believe not on Jesus Christ. But when you believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, his life, death, burial, physical resurrection from the grave to save you from your sins, your sins are covered. And yes, you should walk worthily, but you are saved the instant you believe the gospel and nothing can separate you from the love of God. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us because it's no longer I that live, but Christ that liveth in me. Right. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For no other foundation can any man lay that is laid, which is Christ. Right. No foundation, not gold, not silver, not precious stone, not wood, not hay, not stubble. Right. Because everything will melt with a fervent heat. And Jesus Christ was tried by fire and he is victorious. He rose from that grave. He conquered sin in the grave. And so therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men to believe the gospel. And But there's so many false gospels and so many false Jesuses have gone into the world. 
And the only way we can be reconciled between that great goal fix, right, that separates us from the love of God is through Jesus Christ. And some people say they believe, but they say, well, I got to repent from my sins, right? But that is not repent from his sins, it's repent and believe, right? Of sin because you believe not on me. They say, I got to get water baptized. He says, no. I, John the Baptist said, baptize you with water, but he that cometh after me shall baptize you with what? The spirit. It's the answer answer of a good conscience, not a putting away a filth of the flesh. I got to say a certain prayer. No, just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you say a prayer, that's fine. But as long as you believe in the heart, if it's coming from the heart, it's not because you're depending on the words. I Well, I got to not sin or I got to stop sinning. If we say we have no sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. You sin before and you sin after you're saved, right? But the sin that you do after you're saved, it's the sin of the flesh. But yet what? You're dead to the flesh, dead to the law and dead to sin as far as God's concerned. And he will chastise you in the flesh for the sin you commit in the flesh. But the seed in which you were born with is an incorruptible seed, which is sin in Christ. And in him, there is no sin. Thus, see, your reborn spirit cannot sin. And that's the part that's new. That's the part that's alive, right? That's the all things new. And you have a glorified body. Oh, I got to talk to a priest. I got to go through. No, you can hear this message right now and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe the gospel, and you are saved, right? Believe on the life, death, burial, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ to save you from your sins. You are eternally saved. Your life is hidden in Christ. You have the imputed righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Oh, I, I got to pass investigative judgment. No, nope. there is no more condemnation than those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Jesus Christ became guilty so that we could become what? Innocent. Right? I got to keep the Sabbath or the holy days. Jesus said, enter my rest. He is the rest. Right? What day is it in eternity? Right? So we rest in Jesus Christ. I got to endure to the end. I got to bear fruit. Well, it's no longer I that live. Right? You ended and you are sealed in Christ. Right? And you have this imputed faith in works. So endure to the end. You, people don't seem to understand that the instant you believe in Jesus Christ, you are what? Crucified. Right? You're, that's why it says you're dead to the flesh, dead to the law, dead to sin. Right? You're no longer married to the law. Right? You're dead. And you're married to another. Right? You are the bride of Christ. Right? But there's many false brides because many people believe they got to do all these things in red, right? And they just haven't believed the gospel. It's too, they call it easy believism. They say, oh, it's one and done. And they, and they, they um, despise mercy. But Jesus came to show his exceeding mercy. They despise grace. They say you're an abuser of his grace. Um, grace is grace. If it be not of grace, then it must be of the law, be it by the work, and and be no by the law, no flesh shall be justified. So that's part, these are all people who are part of the Lord, Lord crowd. Because they think, quote unquote, they're protecting God's holiness, right? But they're reprobate in every good work, right? So you need to believe that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes on him shall not perish but have everlasting life and once you believe on him you're imputed the faith of christ and the works of christ and the works of the holy spirit right and again it's the spirit that is sinless in christ and can't sin and yes christians should walk worthily and be a light but you're not saved by anything you do after believe the gospel you're not unsaved you can't be unsaved by anything you do after believing the gospel Right. There's no sin, quote unquote, in the flesh that can separate you because your spirit is sealed in Jesus Christ and you're dead to the flesh and to the law. Romans 5.20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense should might abound. But where sin abound, grace did much more abound. <laughs> so when you look at this verse, where sin abound, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life. By who? Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Now you look at Romans 6 and says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. People misquote this verse and try to say, well, no, if you continue to sin, then then you you can you can, you know, yeah, nothing can separate us, but you can separate yourself. That's just do you understand how um how not how conceited and how self-righteous that statement, even though you think it's pious, do you understand how self-righteous that statement is? that you can overwhelm the grace of God, right? I, I just, you have to really think about what you're saying and take it to the next, okay, well, Jesus Christ is perfect Lamb of God, his blood, he's incorruptible, he's incorruptible seed, I'm sealed in Jesus Christ, there is no sin, my spirit's reborn, and I'm dead to the flesh and dead to the law as far as God's concerned. And it says here, it says, where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. But then people say, well, you know, I can sin in the flesh and somehow that's going to, that sin in my flesh somehow gets to, it has to get through, it has to overpower Jesus, get, break through Jesus, break through, actually, because Jesus, the Father and the Holy Spirit are one, has to break through Godhead and overpower the Godhead and then get to your reborn spirit that's sealed in him and take him out, take you out. I don't think people understand. Sometimes you have to think about what you're saying and think about what other people tell you because that statement itself is just, it's, it's like, it's blasphemy. How should we that are dead to sin, wow, dead to sin, live any longer therein? So it's saying you're dead to sin. How can you live any longer therein? It's because it's like saying, look, we're dead to sin. So should we use our liberty as a license to sin? Just because we know that we can no longer be, uh, we can no longer uh, go to hell, that we're saved. Does that mean, oh, well, let's, you know, now that we're saved, let's just go live uh, in a way that unbelievers uh, won't feel any any type of, you know, conviction and they won't know our love because love and kindness was drawn. They won't know our love. So let's just go live selfishly and forget everyone else now that we're saved. Right. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism in death. And that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should, should walk in newness of life. That word should. You know, these people, people go to the Greek and they don't seem to get the English. Christians should walk worthily. But the question asked is, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Right? Know that your flesh still sins, and God disciplines his sons even unto sleep. Remember when I first started, when I talked about Jesus, and he, and he gave the gospel, and it says he was seen uh, by the twelve, and by five hundred brethren, many who are still with us today, but some who, have sleep, who are asleep. Right, because they're already dead. You see, because Christians are already dead to the flesh, so they never refer to Christians as, as as dying again. Right, because we sleep. Right, and that's why it says it's appointed a man wants to die, then the judgment. Right, you're already dead. You've already been judged. You've been judged with the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Right, for whom the Lord loved, He chastened and scourges every son whom He receives. Well, why is He going to scourge and chasten you if you don't sin in the flesh? That's baffling. Like you really have to think about it. Right. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, right? We were saved by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, right? That's what we're guilty of. We're not guilty of not keeping the law. We're guilty of the Lord's body and abusing his grace, trampling the grace of our Lord. For this cause many are weak and sick and many are sleep you can be chastised to the point of sleep but that is it because you're already dead to the flesh right god is basically essentially saying if if you are not walking worthily you are not being a light and not doing things that help win other people to jesus christ what is your point of being here right 
So instead of letting you go out and live a crazy life, well, you can be hindered. God says, okay, I'll, I'll take care of that. I'll make you weak. You can't go out and party it up and live a sinful life if you're, if you're weak and sickly now, can you? And you definitely can't party it up and be a, be a bad example to people if you're dead or, or sleep. You already died, but you sleep. So God, from out of love, right? He's chasing you in love, right? Him who the Lord uh, loveth, he chastens. Says, look, this isn't good for you, you know? And it's not good for other people because I came to save. I came to save. I will that all men be saved, right? And you get in the way of that. All right, this life is but a vapor. We're talking eternity. Come on, go on it. Go ahead. God will take you home, right? But he doesn't want you to hinder um cause the unbelievers to quote unquote blast, use you as an excuse have you give them an excuse to blaspheme the holy spirit and they're still going to be responsible but you are responsible too right and so god will chasten you for that right right for if we would judge ourselves we should not be judged but when we are judged we are chastened of the lord that we should not be condemned with the world right so that is it and i hope that's a blessing to you so let's do a final exam are you a sinner Yes, right? Who is Jesus? Is he God in the flesh, the only begotten Son of God? Is he the way, only way to go to the Father in heaven, the sinless sacrifice and Savior of the world, the creator of all creation? Is he God's elect servant, right? Isaiah 42 through 1, 6. Or is he all the above? All the above, right? Why did Jesus? What did Jesus do to save sinners? He humbled himself, became a man. He died on the cross for the sins of the world. He conquered sin and death. He right? rose from the grave the third day. He availed reconciliation between God and man. He's the only mediator between God and man, right? Did he, he pay for all sins by his blood or is it all the above? It's all the above. What is the purpose of the law? What is the commandment? To let us know that we must, must do to be, what we must do to be saved, to indicate who is really saved or not, to keep us saved, or to show, to show that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ. It's like a schoolmaster. Well, it's to show that we need to put our faith in Jesus Christ, right? Jesus Christ said, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And by the law shall no flesh be justified. What must sinners do to be eternally saved from hell? Everything you must do to be eternally saved from hell. What is the complete, all-encompassing thing that we must do? We must believe on Jesus' finished work on the cross. Believe on Jesus and get water baptized. Repent from your sins and believe on Jesus. Believe on Jesus and repent from future sins. Believe on Jesus and endure till the end. Believe on Jesus and bear fruits or all the above. No, we need to believe on Jesus' finished work on the cross. Believe on his sacrifice, right? You believe on Jesus, you'll never perish, right? Right? It's, the, it's all about, you know, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish, but to those of us who are saved, it is the work of God, right? The power of God. When is a person eternally saved? After they endure to the end in their flesh? After the investigative judgment? After they become perfected by evidence of fruit? After they believe the gospel of Christ? After believing the gospel and keeping the law? You can't know you're saved. Well, it's after they believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember Ephesians 1, 12 through 14. What happens when a saved person disobeys God? Nothing at all. We have a license to sin. They could lose their salvation. They're chastised by God as a loving father, all the above. They're chastised as a loving father. And you can be chastised by weakness in your body, sickness in your body, and to the point of where the body is destroyed. But as far as Christ is concerned, you're already dead to the flesh, right? So there's no sin in the reborn spirit, and you have a glorified body that awaits you in heaven. That's what all things new, old things are passed away, right? I'm not talking about your behavior when it says that old things are passed away, right? It's the imputed righteousness of Christ. So from that standpoint, it's true. But it's the imputed righteousness of Christ. It's all of Christ, none of us. And all we had to do, all we did was believe, right? The gospel. How can you lose your salvation? By not enduring until the end, by committing horrible, willful sins. If I don't repent after I sin, I don't go to church and fellowship and say you don't pay tithes or whatever, which is, by the way, under the law. Uh, by not being progressively sanctified, sanctified, uh, I should just say sanctified, yeah, because it's a fairy tale Santa Claus. None of the above, all of the above. None of the above. You cannot lose your salvation. If you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, truly believe the gospel, you are saved, right? Uh, but if you if you don't believe it, you say you don't believe Jesus is uh, God in the flesh, you think he's Michael the Archangel, as Jehovah's Witnesses believe, 
Uh, if you don't believe he rose from the grave uh, physically, like Jehovah Witnesses believe, um, if you believe you got to endure to the end or show fruits like uh, Calvinists believe, um, if you, you know, there's all kinds of things like you can have a fake Jesus who didn't die for all this for the sins of the whole world. Um, so you have another Christ and another gospel. But if you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you believe on the finished work of Jesus Christ, you are saved and there's nothing you can do to lose it. Nothing can separate you. What Bible should you read? Which is well, let's just put it this way: which is which Bible on the market today for the English speaker is is the, the Bible you should read? NIV. Well, no, the NIV has in places where you can actually be disowned. Meaning, you could be a son and 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 somehow lose your, be disowned by God, which is contrary to the Scripture. ESV. Nope. ESV. NIV. NASB. NKJV. They all take out the faith of Christ. Uh, look at that verse that I told you to look up and you'll find that same thing with NLT. Uh, all Bibles are pretty much the same or KJV, authorized KJV. You should look at the KJV. And when I say KJV, I'm not talking of KJV with commentary. Satan is so clever. He's got so many ways to trick you. He can trick you with subtitles in the Bible. He can trick you with uh, commentary before the Bible and little and these quote unquote study Bibles are the best way to trick people. Look, to be a Berean means you go to the scriptures and only the scriptures. You don't read the commentary. You don't read in between the margins. You just read the scriptures, right? The scriptures alone. You use the scriptures alone, praying and contemplating and thinking about and meditating on the word of God and, and, and asking the Holy Spirit for guidance, knowing that God the Father does not lie and knowing that God does not lie and that um, that God reveals, him, reveals himself through his word. When they say, those who have seen Jesus, have you seen him physically with your eyes? No, you see him through the, through the word, through the scriptures. So any scripture that perverts the word and takes out the fact that Jesus had faith, when we all know that without faith it's impossible to please God, well, that's perverted. That's a perverted Jesus, right? Any scripture that says that um, those who are born of God don't continue to sin when we actually know that those who are born of God is talking about the spirit and you cannot sin. That's perverting Jesus, right? It's perverting Jesus and the gift. So KJV has that right. These other versions have it wrong. And, you know, if you want to use those other verses, do so at your own peril. But just so you know, your, your doctrine is going to be off. It's, it's definitely going to be off and there's going to be confusion. And there's going to be contradictions. And then what does contradictions cause? Doubt. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God. If you have a Bible that contradicts, it's going to cause doubt. And we're supposed to grow in faith. So how should you ultimately test what is from God? Study the KJV yourself. And I say KJV because you know what? I know there's other Bibles that, um, you know, were, were good Bibles, but you can't buy them. You can't buy the Bishop's Bible anymore, right? So... Study the KJV yourself. Read, read trusted Bible commentary. Look at church history and fathers. Yeah, yeah read the church fathers, right? They had it all right. Uh, buy Christian books on the topic. Look for signs and miracles. Rely on YouTube, right? Yeah, just listen to me, the guy who's speaking right now, right? Don't check your Bible and check what I'm saying, right? Don't test the spirits. Don't be a Berean, right? Ask the religious leaders in your church. No, we're supposed to test the spirits, right? The Bereans were more Thessalonic, more noble-minded than the Thessalonians. That they, they tested to see that these things were so right. We we go to the Bible. We don't go to commentary. We don't go to people. It's okay to ask people their what they think or how do they how do you read it? Because Jesus would ask those questions all the time, clarifying questions. Of course, Jesus knew the answer, but um, a lot of times you ask questions because it's good to know where another person is, right? Um, a lot of times people go around, they call people brothers and sisters in Christ. And then you find out the person doesn't believe in the finished work. They'll say they believe the gospel. They'll say it's all of grace, all of faith. It's all God. But then they'll say, well, but you got to bear fruit. Oh, and but if you really are saved, you won't be sinning. You know, you'll stop sinning or you'll be horribly, horribly uh, uh, sorrowful and remorseful. If, if you're a true Christian. Um you have to watch that. You got to watch who you call brother because some people say that with their mouth, but then when you ask them questions, you find out they actually think 
that if you don't quote unquote bear fruit, you're not saved. But well, they don't understand that the fruit, is, the fruit is imputed to you because the work I do, ye do also, and greater works than these because I return to the Father, said Jesus Christ. So those people don't understand that it's actually finished, the meaning that you no longer live and the life of Christ is imputed to you, right? And that you are dead. So there's nothing left for you to do, you know? And, uh, but if they don't understand that, you need to ask those questions. So one, that you can, one, help them to, to believe the true gospel, and that you don't partake in their sin by calling them a brother when they're not a brother. Because that just leads to more deception. Because they'll think, oh, well, this person agrees with me that if I don't bear fruit in the, you know, visible fruit before men. You know, that's not true. Um, by the way, not while I'm at it, if you go to James 2, uh, talking about the imputed faith of Jesus Christ, right? James 2 is a verse that confuses a lot of people. It's have, but it, look at it the way it starts. It says, Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ with respect to person. Have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. It starts out talking about the imputed faith of Jesus Christ. Read the KJV version. They've changed that in all the other, the NLT, the ESV, NASB, um, NIV, um, NKJV. They change that to take out the have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, taking the faith of Christ out. But when you read that James 2 and you understand that it's telling you that you have the imputed faith of Christ. And though you have the imputed faith of Christ, you yourself can um, have can lack faith, right? And have not the works that go with faith. You understand then that you it first starts out giving you the assurance that, hey, you may not do these things before men. You may not be showing love. You may not. You may be showing respect to person like Peter did and had to be called out by Paul. You may be doing all these things. And that's and, and God does not condone those. But it starts out telling you, you have the faith of Christ. Right. Imputed to you have not the faith of our Lord, but it's telling you you have the faith of Christ imputed to you, but don't not do works of faith, right? This is not talking about salvation. This is just talking about before men because men will say um, you have a dead faith, right? Of course, men are going to accuse you of having dead faith because no one can look at another person and say that person's saved, that person's not saved. You looked at David when he was with Bathsheba. Did you, oh, you, did you think he was saved at that point? Of course not, right? Anyone who saw David would be like, that guy, show me your faith by your works, buddy. You know, the way you're uh, sleep with that got that guy's wife knocked up and now you're trying to murder him samson solomon abraham moses i mean every every single person in the scriptures has you know so you know but don't fall for this progressive sanctification saying well no it's over the span of my lifetime as a christian uh well i guess people want to think saul's in hell right though jesus called him god anointed after he was he was after he murdered himself, after he killed himself in suicide out of pride because he didn't want to be killed by his enemies. Right. But I guess through the Holy Spirit, David supposedly lied and said he was God's God's anointed. Right. Right. So, you know, you have to make the Bible contradict and you have to make their all kinds of respect of persons in the Bible. If you're going to believe what these people are telling you, because it's not of works. That's why you can say Jacob have I loved and Esau hated before they even born. It's because they believed on uh, Jacob believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Who was before eternity, who was before the foundation of earth, which is before they was born, and thus he was sealed and his life was hidden in Christ, right? From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith, right? But the faith of Christ is what secures us, right? So yeah, you guys study the Bible yourself. So just remember Jesus says, believe the gospel. If you're hearing this and you don't believe the gospel, the gospel is uh, Jesus was born of a virgin, right? He's the only begotten of the Father. It's just letting you know who Jesus is, right? He's God in the flesh. He's fully man and fully God. But Jesus lived a perfect sinless life, right? He walked perfect before the Father in perfect faith, right? He never denied the Father, right? He died on the cross for our sins, was bruised for our transgressions and iniquities, right? He was buried rose from the grave the third day, right? And he ascended into the right hand of the Father. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, you know what? He discounts your life. Your life is no longer counted. He actually imputes his life to you from when he was a baby to when he 
till to all the way up till he ascended to the Father. And in fact, you're not only that, you're reborn in the spirit, which is in eternity, and you're born again, right? And because you're born again of the spirit, that's why you're sealed in Jesus Christ of who was born of the spirit, right? And you're imputed the whole life of Christ, and you know the Father from the past before you're born, in the present, and in the future, right? So though you're already seated in heavenly places, because you're still in the present, because you're still alive, we look forward. We are, the day is closer to when we first believed. But believe, believe you me, it's already finished, right? That's what God tells you. That's what God promises. God bless you. Um, I love you. Um, and uh, I did this out of love. I, I All praise goes to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. And it's, you know, Please just believe the gospel. Just believe the gospel and you are saved. Okay?